The 23rd of May 1964 was, like today, a beautiful summer's day. A perfect opportunity, thought Jim Templeton, to take his family out for the day. Little did he know that something would happen that day that would make headlines around the world. Those headlines made such a splash that those ripples are still being felt today. This is the story of the Solway Firth Spaceman, with what I believe is conclusive and brand new evidence that proves what happened that day, and you're going to be the first to hear it. Jim Templeton was a fireman who, in 1964, lived with his wife and two children. Elizabeth was five and Francis was nine. On the 23rd of May 1964, they visited Berg Marsh, an area of grassland overlooking the Solway Firth, which forms part of the border between England and Scotland. It was a quiet day. They had the marsh to themselves. Jim states that the only other people on the marsh that day were two old ladies sat in a car at the far end of the grassland. His five-year-old, Elizabeth, was wearing a brand new dress and she was rather proud of it. Jim, an amateur photographer, had taken his camera along on the day and he took three photographs of Elizabeth picking flowers. When they got back home, Jim took the film to the chemists to get them developed. A week later he picked up the prints and at first everything seemed normal. But then the chemist who processed the pictures pointed out to Jim that one of the photographs had been spoiled by a figure behind his daughter. Jim said later, I took three pictures of my daughter, Elizabeth, in a similar pose and was shocked when the middle picture came back from Kodak, displaying what looks like a spaceman in the background. Jim was very certain that there was no one else in the scene when he took the photograph, so he asked Kodak to analyse it. They confirmed that the photograph was genuine. It matched the negative exactly. So what do you do if you see a spaceman? You're parking it, man. I'm joking. But when Jim Templeton sees a spaceman, he goes to the police. I'm not at all sure what Jim expected the police to do about it, but after examining the photograph, the police concluded that it was not a police matter and there was no concerns raised. So his next visit was to the local newspaper. He showed them the photograph and was quoted by the paper as saying, the picture is certainly not fake and I am as bemused as anyone as to how this figure appeared in the background. They had a very different reaction to the police. They were very interested and they put it on the front page of the Cumberland News. Within days, the photograph and the story had been picked up by newspapers, magazines and television stations around the world. Within days of the story breaking, Jim received a visit from two men in suits, claiming to be UK government agents. They were men in black type characters, identifying themselves as only number 9 and number 11. They asked Jim to take them to the exact spot where the photograph was taken, which he did. When he told them that he'd seen no mysterious figure on the day the photograph was taken, the men left the scene abruptly. News soon reached a far afield as Australia, highlighted by the planned launch of the Blue Streak missile in Woomera, South Australia. Just days after Jim had taken his photograph, the missile test was aborted by technicians who claimed to have seen two mysterious figures in the firing range. When those two technicians later saw Jim's Solway Spaceman photograph, they were said to be stunned, as the figure looked the same as the figures they saw close to the missile. The plot thickened as the Blue Streak missile had been built at an RAF base in Cumbria, near to Solway Firth. Kodak launched a prize to anyone who could prove that the photograph had been faked. My guess is that they saw this story as an ideal way to get some free advertising. They offered the incredibly generous prize of a year's free film and developing. This fueled the already burning fire of amateur sleuths and detectives trying to piece together exactly who or what the mystery figure could be. For ufologists, it was obvious. A white suit, a helmet, a dark visor. Jim, they believed, had photographed a spaceman. The fact that the Kodak Prize was never claimed only encouraged more theories to emerge. A typical theory was that Jim had captured the photograph of an alien. Both the ship and aliens had been shielded by some sort of cloaking device, obviously. This made them invisible to the human eye, but crucially not to the camera. Jim's picture claimed worldwide attention. It tapped into something in the human psyche of the day. After all, this was the height of the space race, and people were only too willing to accept that, yes, this could be an extraterrestrial spaceman. Jim later recalled in a BBC interview, I had received thousands of letters across the world with various ideas or possibilities, most of which made little sense to me. Even to this day, the internet is alive with theories and explanations as to what happened that day, purporting to have solved 
the Solway Firth Spaceman Mystery. An equal amount maintain that it's still unexplained. It's as popular as ever. Try Googling the Solway Firth Spaceman. You'll be greeted with tens of thousands of websites, articles, blogs and YouTube videos 60 years after the photograph was taken. In 2012, the photograph and the case was examined by Dr. David Clark. He's a professor in the School of Social Sciences at Sheffield Hallam University. He's also a highly successful author. He said, for me, it's one of the most impressive anomalous images in supernatural investigations and people will still be talking about it in another 50 years. That said, he did come up with a very plausible explanation in 2012 for the photograph, which seemingly had been overlooked for the previous 48 years. He suggested that the mystery spaceman was in fact Jim's wife, Annie who was also with them on the marsh that day. There's another photograph taken that day featuring part of Annie, Jim's wife. The quality's terrible. It's a copy of a copy of a copy. But we can clearly see Annie Templeton in her blue dress with bare arms cut high on the shoulder. But he said he couldn't be her because she was stood behind him when the photograph was taken. Dr. Clark suggested that for some reason his wife had walked into the shot and he didn't see her because that particular make of camera could only see 70% of what was in the shot through the viewfinder. Annie, he argued, Argues was standing with her back to the camera and the photograph was overexposed, causing her blue dress and arms to look white. Dr. Clark suggested this explanation in 2012. But if you were to look at blogs and other discussion forums, even to this day, many people just don't buy it. They point to the fact that the figure is clearly on a tilt. Others point out that if it were his wife, then she would have to be 10 feet tall or more, given how far away she would have to be in the photograph. It is true that it's hard to imagine a pair of legs reaching the floor when looking at that image. Others say that the the shoulders are far too broad to be Annie. In this photograph, she seems a slightly built female. And everyone comes back to the helmet of the spaceman. We know that Annie had dark brown hair, so that explains this dark area that looks like a visor. But that's clearly a white dome over her head. She wasn't wearing any headgear that day. She didn't have white hair. There's no explanation anywhere on the internet to explain the white dome, which along with the black hair makes it look like a helmet with a visor. All explanations seem to fail at this point. So here we are, 11 years after the the photograph was debunked by Dr. Clark, but many still don't believe it and cling on to the spaceman theory. First of all, let's put our logical head on here. Clearly, this is the outside of the person's elbow, which does suggest that she we'll call the figure she, is walking away with her back to the camera. The figure does look far away, and it does seem an implausible stretch to accept a normally sized human could have a body long enough to go to the ground, from what we can see here. I think having Elizabeth in the foreground doesn't allow us to see perspectives here. Let's start with the original photograph. Having Elizabeth covering part of the figure doesn't allow us to understand the depth of field. Let's reconstruct the scene with composite images. It's not perfect, but it gives us a blank canvas to work with. Let's put Elizabeth Elizabeth back into the scene and then compare our new composite image with the original. That's accurate and compares well with the original. Now let's add in our spaceman again. Check our new image with the original. That does look accurate. We've disassembled the photograph and reassembled it with its component parts to be faithful to the original image. Now we can move Elizabeth out of the way and add in an additional image representing the bottom half of Annie Templeton. It's not a perfect representation, but it does allow us to understand how far the figure is away from Elizabeth and how the figure comes into contact with the grassy bank. This debunks the idea that the figure would have to be inordinately tall. Let's put Elizabeth almost back into position. That now gives us a much better idea as to what's going on in the scene. I've also given Annie's arms some colour and returned the dress to a pale blue. In the previous photo with Annie, we could see that she had bare arms all the way up to her shoulders. That does fit with what we can see in the photograph. There is enough detail present to show that the arms and the body are distinct. That investigation does clear up a lot of the issues with this photograph. Whilst the figure does appear out of place with Elizabeth blocking most of the body, it makes lots of sense once the girl is removed. We can now perceive where the figure is in relation to Elizabeth and the horizon, and it makes more sense. Adding in some colour to the arms and torso helps too. Everything fits, except her head. It does look like she's wearing a helmet. There's a definite white dome above her head and to the side of her head. Could there be something white and circular, maybe disc-like in front of Annie, lined up with her perfectly, maybe be in the sky, but what could possibly be in the sky? Both white and circular, and visible during the day. The moon? 
Maybe she stood exactly in line with the moon. I haven't seen this hypothesis suggested anywhere else. On the 23rd of May 1964, the moon was in its waxing gibbous phase. This is the phase where the moon is more than 50% illuminated, but has not yet reached 100% illumination. This is the moon in waxing gibbous phase. And this is how the moon would have looked on the 23rd of May 1964. It would have been bright white in the sky even in daylight. Let's shrink this image of the moon down and slip it behind the head of our spaceman. This is an image of the moon in waxing gibbous phase. People often see a waxing gibbous moon in the afternoon, shortly after moonrise. The moon at this phase is easy to see in the day. It's typically seen at a low angle in the sky between 10 and 20 degrees. On the 23rd of May 1964, 94.49% of the moon was lit, so it may have appeared even fuller than in this image. Let's go back to our composite photograph. There's clearly a white dome over the head of our mystery figure. Let's see if we can remove it. We're left with a very small looking head, but that's the only dark area that's left once the white dome has been removed. Let's now put the waxing gibbous moon in the sky. That does look between 10 and 20 degrees, but it's too sharp. Let's put it out of focus so that it matches the fuzzy appearance of our character and the clouds. Let's now slide it behind our spaceman to see if we can recreate that dome. <laughs> Let's go back to our earlier composite photograph. The spaceman theory comes from the fact that the dark area looks like a visor. I think it's the back of Annie's head and the image has been distorted by the presence of the moon. We don't see her entire head. Let's put the back of a normal sized female head on our spaceman that I think we would have seen if Annie hadn't clashed with the moon. Suddenly the whole body looks to be more in proportion, the shoulders look less broad and everything looks well with the world. That to my mind is a very credible explanation for why we have the look of a helmet on this image. The photograph was taken when Annie's head was perfectly lined up with the moon from the viewpoint of Jim's camera. It explains the dome above her head and the dome appearance on the left hand side of her head. The figure is in the background and out of focus so no shapes can be totally relied upon but I believe that the moon theory gives us the most credible explanation yet as to why Annie's head looks like she's wearing a spaceman's helmet. The Solway Firth spaceman is in fact Jim's wife Annie and he has five main reasons for that claim but before I round them up please allow me just 20 seconds to plug this channel if you've got this far in this video and you have else you wouldn't have heard me say that then you're a keeper very nearly interesting is a brand new channel we've got no sponsors and we need all the help we can get here's three ways that you can help one please click like on this video that way more people will see it two please subscribe. You're 10 times more likely to come back again and watch more of our content. And three, if you want to buy a super thanks, the button is below this video. We'll make sure that you're included in the credits on the very next video. One, she's wandered into the shot, walking away from the camera. Her clothing is consistent with an earlier photograph. Two, the restricted view on the viewfinder of the camera explains why Jim didn't see her at the time. Three, the image was overexposed because it was a sunny day. That's given the entire figure a white look, except her dark hair at the back of her head. Four, Jim has taken the photograph at the exact moment that her head was lined up with the moon in waxing gibbous phase, giving the partly dome-like appearance around her head. Five, other anomalies can be explained by the fact that the image was out of focus. It was several feet behind the main subject of the photograph, which was in focus. That's a common feature in photography which denotes depth of field. Do you agree with me? Let me know in the comments. Please do check out some more content on Very Nearly Interesting. We've actually got quite a lot these days. Thank you for watching this video. Please do hit that like button if you've enjoyed it. It really does help the video to spread further and helps this channel. And we hope to see you again very soon. <laughs>